Some of you know that when I was in rabbinical, I interned as a chaplain in a hospital in Manhattan. And this is something that many rabbinic students do. It's called clinical pastoral education, CPE. And when you train to be a chaplain, you have to spend a lot of time with clergy of other faiths. That summer, I worked alongside a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, and an Episcopalian. And being as we were in Manhattan, I thought more or less that I, repping the J team, had sort of the home court advantage, <laughs> which is admittedly a terrible metaphor for chaplaincy, I realize. And in any case, I was wrong. It turned out that most of my time was spent praying and meditating with and caring for people who were not Jewish. It was the most sustained interfaith experience I think I've ever actually had. In our weekly cohort meetings, it was immediately clear to me that each of my fellow chaplains were very comfortable speaking in a register that most of my rabbinic peers were not. The most obvious piece was that they talked unflinchingly about God. They spoke emotionally and movingly about how God had called them to their ministries, that they had a divine mission on earth. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm basically here for the kiddush. <laughs> Many of you know me by now, that's not exclusively true, but so be it. It did seem to me that the other seminarians were in a different business from me altogether. And nonetheless, as perhaps I would have hoped, that internship challenged me in a number of important ways. Above all, I grappled that summer with my ministry, which is, of course, a word that I still feel a little uneasy about. I had to interrogate the extent to which my mission was to serve the Jewish people versus saving the world or serving the world writ large. That was a Freudian slip, but be that as it may. <laughs> serving both the Jewish people and the world. I had to get comfortable not only with Jewish texts and Jewish people, but the depths of the human experience and figure out where the two intersect. That summer was kind of like a boot camp for engaging with the greatest tension that many of us ask ourselves or experience as Jews living in the modern world. And in this week's Torah portion, we find ourselves at the locus classicus of that tension with a biblical hero that quite literally had a calling from God. Parashat Lech Lecha introduces us to Avram, soon to be named Avraham, the first Jew according to our tradition, or to be more precise, the first Hebrew. God calls out to him, as many of us know, in the first verse of this week's Torah portion, and says, Lech Lecha, go forth, and shortly thereafter details the covenant that God will make with all of Abraham's descendants, which is to say, us. In addition to all of the wonderful various things that come with having a special covenant with God, for many of us, the whole thing carries with it a certain queasiness and ambivalence about being different from other peoples. But there's another story to tell, a different story perhaps, about what's going on in this first encounter between Abraham and God, or rather Avram and God. And even if we're inclined to read Abraham as the father of Jewish particularism, <coughs> giving us our unique Jewish relationship to God, Torah, and the land of Israel, both the plain sense of the Torah and early rabbinic exegesis suggest something much more universalistic. The text says, as is in perhaps echoing in your ear, those of you who know the, the Bible quite well, Lech lecha me'artzecha umimoladtecha umibet avicha. Go forth away from your land, your birthplace, and your father's house. In so doing, Avram makes himself alien. And these three categories, land, birthplace, and house, are distinct from one another. So commentaries abound on why each word is used to describe roughly the same thing, some kind of place, some whatever place he's leaving from. One 19th century commentary known as Kitab Vihakabala points out that these three categories are presented in exactly the opposite way from what you might think. If the Torah were speaking literally, it would have been in the opposite order. First you leave your house, then you leave your city, then your country. 
But according to the commentary, Abraham's task here is not merely practical, but spiritual, emotional, metaphysical. First, he has to wrap his mind around leaving his country, then his daily life in the places most familiar to him, and then, finally, he has to do the hardest thing of all, remove himself from his family. Reading these trials in the order that the Torah presents shows how radically Abraham has, has to move out of the thinking he was born with. He has to leave every aspect of his familial and national life and become essentially a blank canvas. And what he's doing is not simply plot here. It's not simply about what he's literally doing. Spiritually, Abraham has to unmoor himself. He has to get himself into a completely blank state of being. It's in that mode of being totally free of familial or national ties that Abraham is able to pursue God's mission for him. And we tend to see it as the opposite, but actually the very first thing he's supposed to do is to actually become nationless. Even if he's the father of our so-called nation, he's supposed to be nationless. Maimonides teaches that this Parsha is in fact not really just the beginning of the Jewish people, but importantly, the first time in history, according to him, that any human being came to understand that there was only one God. For Maimonides, among others, the great strength of Abraham was his ability to bring light to the world, since all people, not only Jews, should realize their shared creator. Though we tend to see Judaism as a religion that is inwardly focused and does not proselytize, according to many early Midrashim, Abraham and Sarah went around the ancient world converting people. And that was why they needed to leave their homeland, so they could effect effectively become missionaries, to bring people in as opposed to separating themselves out, which is frequently how we see it. Shortly after saying, go forth in this Parsha, God does say, I will admit to you, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. In this sense, we get a whiff of chosenness and particularism, but the key part is what comes next. And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless you, and curse those who curse you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The medieval grammarian Rashbam points out that it's presented in the passive. Families of the earth will be blessed. The basic meaning of the verse is that the offspring of Avram, the Jews, are meant to engage with other peoples of the world and bless them. My favorite commentary comes from Rashi on this one, who teaches that in this moment, God is saying to Avram, until this moment, blessings have been in my hand. I blessed Adam and Noah, but from now on, you, Avram, get to bless anyone you like. It's not wrong to understand Abraham as the mythic father of the Jewish people, the first patriarch. Of course he is. And it's true that the unique relationship between our people and God has its origin in this story. But what's more important from both the Pshat and the Drash, the text itself and the early commentaries, is that for Abraham and his descendants, being blessed means engaging with and blessing others. It is true that the Jewish relationship with God is expressed in a certain way with specific stories, commandments, and languages. But the ultimate aim of our tradition is a world of blessing for all peoples. Sometimes we might forget this as Jews, focusing instead on our difference. And as I felt that summer in the hospital, we are different in some ways from people of other faith traditions. But ultimately, our particularistic tradition is founded on the universalistic idea that the whole world deserves to be blessed. That summer, my fellow chaplains and I were, in the end, equally small in the face of our task. We talked in different ways, sometimes about different things, but each of us tried to help people equally. Sometimes we were successful, but most of the time we didn't really know what we were doing, and we didn't know what success actually meant. We were there to serve people, to comfort them, to visit them as they healed. And these acts, by the way, are the ones for which Abraham is most famous. And we, in our covenant, can't claim them really as exclusively ours. Though we might feel different at times as Jews, thanks in part to our historic relationship to Abraham, may we also recognize that like our forebears, our difference is only meaningful 
if it serves to bless the world. Shabbat Shalom.